Welcome. Thank you for being here this afternoon. We are really excited to get to hear from our other three Capstone students about the topics that they have been working on all semester. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Joyce about AI and art, and then from Kyle, also about AI um, and security. And then we're going to finish off with Abby talking to us about aging. All right, so you can welcome up Joyce. Can artificial intelligence be more human than humans? That is the question I pondered as I scrolled through a series of AI images, images that inspire as much awe and emotion as human creator art can. There have been times when I'm scrolling on social media and these incredible images will show up on my feed. Detailed digital art pieces, cinematic photographs, even fashion shows. And then I'll check the hashtags and realize they were AI generated. But AI art has done more than take the internet by storm, becoming the focus of art social media accounts or becoming a trend. It has entered the more official artistic spaces as well. It hangs in art galleries, sells at auctions, wins competitions. AI images are exhibited in the Dead End Gallery in Amsterdam. The portrait of Edmund de Blamey was part of a series of AI images, and it sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars at an auction. And the Crow was an AI short film that won an award at the Cannes Short Film Festival. And according to Chatterjee, because our social spaces and institutions have accepted AI art, it is art. What defines art and creativity ultimately boils down to what we humans decided to be. This phenomenon, this rise of AI art, can be intimidating as AI competes with and even outperforms people in certain areas. AI was first predicted to enhance productivity in mundane tasks, performing the simple function of a tool. But it has now seeped into the creative field as well, affecting the very media and entertainment most of us consume, and entering a field once heralded as intrinsically human. Creativity has generally been seen through an anthropocentric view, where people assign more value to objects created by humans than those created through other means. And in a way, this is because Creativity defines the human experience, bringing people and technology to new heights together. Problem solving for a math question, adapting to social situations, innovating machines or products, and self-expression through writing or performance art. All these aspects of humanity use creativity, which in art is generally defined as possessing both novelty and meaning. To relinquish this term of creativity and to give it to AI instead, is frankly an intimidating thought. Even as AI art grows increasingly prevalent, however, even as, it holds, even as it holds the potential to further creativity, it doesn't replace the need for people. Jarvis proposed the idea of AI artists not being true artists, but being art directors. Even when AI artists prompt AI with a specific end product in mind, they are describing the desired end product not creating their own artistic interpretation of the idea. Like a band conductor or someone requesting a commission in detail, directors may know what the final end product looks like, but they do not physically go and craft it. Yet, as all things do, definitions of artist and art and creativity can change. The art that resulted from other historical art movements furthered the boundaries of art and, therefore, creativity. People generally resisted art or tools that were now be hailed as entirely natural. Art movements like neoclassical art, cubism, art nouveau, and more rebelled against an aspect of their time, whether due to the change in culture or in direct opposition to the time's art styles. Even cameras, which were resistant in their early days due to the concern that they'd remove the need for realism in art, cameras ended up opening a new avenue in the creative space instead of closing doors. AI is simply the latest in a long line of tools that fit into ever-changing definitions of creativity. As Subotsky and Artis in Johannesburg says, the power and relevance of art is that its boundaries are always expanding. There should be a space for every kind of art. And I wanted to see different people's artistic interpretations of a prompt, celebrating the ways creativity manifests in different people. 
And so I put together a project collecting these doodles, these uh, quick drawings from people of various ages, whether they considered themselves artists or not. I also included a variety of responses resulting from inputting that same prompt into AI generators. And the bottom line I got was this. Everyone's artwork was a unique interpretation, a mini showcase of their creativity. And it was a beautiful thing to witness both the similarities and the differences in interpretations. Throughout history, artists have taken inspiration from and learned from other artists and artwork, but never in the same way that AI uses neural networks to learn styles and techniques from diverse data sets. Artists fail to perfectly replicate another artist's style. They inadvertently add their own style, their own touch and emotion to the piece they're creating, even if they've learned from a different style. This imperfection is what differentiates them from AI's systematically flawless imitation. Then again, perhaps true novelty, which is generally one required element of creativity, perhaps true novelty may never be fully possible because all that humans create is an amalgamation of other ideas. Through AI and its vast array of artistic pieces, humans can see the world from a different perspective, sparking their creativity. AI may require less intent in the creation process when used a certain way, but it can still further creativity. Creativity has always combined ideas, just as AI combines ideas to create new ones that can inspire people. It's a game changer if AI can further human creativity rather than hinder it. And it can further creativity. Here are three ways. First, AI can generate novel, never-before-seen images. Just as humans create new works that have been inspired by other artists and artwork, the algorithms AI has learned help it produce novel works, which can also go on to inspire people. And the source of inspiration behind both AI-generated and human-created art doesn't affect the novelty of the final art piece. Next, co-creativity. The intersection of human and AI work can catalyze the formation of ideas. AI can be a starting point for an artist's journey, eliciting an emotion or reminding them of an experience that can inspire their creativity. Additionally, AI is an expert at divergent thinking, making a multitude of different, unique ideas and doing it so quickly as well. Because of AI's ability to make so many different pieces and ideas and to do it so quickly as well, it is even more capable of producing a large variety of works that can catalyze the creativity of others. Both humans and AI can inspire and learn from each other and continue forming novel ideas. As humans aid AI, AI can inspire humans and the cycle can continue churning and churning and furthering creativity. Thirdly, the accessibility of AI art aids it in furthering creativity. The contemporary world relies on, on technology and the digital and shows that digital art forms and expressions of creativity are bound to be appealing. Generative art platforms have reached numerous people. According to Bowderson, stable diffusion has surpassed 10 million users. DALI has over 1.5 million users, despite being paywalled and Dream by Wombo has over 10 million downloads. Although these numbers may not directly translate to the exact number of people exper experimenting with or being inspired to create with AI art tools, they do provide insight into how prevalent AI art tools are. AI art tools lower the perceived barrier of entry into art, um, encouraging more people, including those who will not attempt art otherwise, to create aesthetically pleasing images or videos. Whether all who create with AI can be considered artists or not, whether AI itself can be creative, um, AI tools can stimulate more people to begin acting creatively. Regardless of whether our definitions, allow, definitions of creativity allow creativity to be intrinsically human or not, AI can enhance and work towards furthering human creativity. Whatever feelings you harbor for or against AI art or its ability to further creativity, AI art is undeniably prevalent in today's world. Already, AI is revolutionizing the creative industries. Lao states that within the field of game design, 
Generative AI can produce what concept artists used to produce at a fraction of the time and cost. According to both UC and Lau, AI could take the places of artists because it can generate numerous designs and aid in areas such as concepts for product or game design. Additionally, tedious processes such as visual effect production for movies can be assisted by AI. It's possible, however, to interpret this AI assistance differently. We can interpret it as um, this AI assistance in the creative field as clearing the way for people to be truly creative by removing said tedious processes and allowing people to focus on other aspects of creativity. If you look at some earlier advancements in digital art, they allowed people to, for example, add texture and change colors over large areas of space. This allowed people to do this far more easily and quickly than hand drawing would have taken, and giving them more time to focus on other aspects of creativity. As AI's potential grows, however, issues surrounding it also grow obvious. There is less incentive for artists and songwriters to create if their individuality can be imitated or copied by AI. And although we don't have all the answers yet, certain solutions have been proposed that can mitigate such issues regarding copyright, ownership, accountability, and more. Gan Vida is a site that generates art, and it is taking a step towards protecting artists and supplying a form of credit to the previous artworks involved in creating its new images. It does so by storing the lineages of its new images. Baskin, an entrepreneur and artist, utilizes this lineage by labeling curated or edited pieces with a QR code of the image's lineage. Additionally, artists should be given a choice in allowing their work to aid AI algorithm learning or not. They should be compensated when their art is used or provided with other means to reduce the ethical issues of AI art. Numerous other concerns also relate to AI art, its merit, its ethics, they do not subtract from the idea that the very essence of creativity lies in attempting the new. We must work towards solving these issues, and we need regulation over AI art tools, even as we provide a space for this new form of art. But we cannot villainize a tool, and that's what AI art is, a tool for us to utilize in the creative process. As technology continues developing exponentially, AI art isn't going to disappear. Instead, people and creatives alike must adapt to the use of this tool. People can retool and become proficient at using the latest technology in order to stay relevant in this changing creative landscape. They can choose co-creativity, utilizing AI tools in their creative processes and working together. New careers open as technological advances force others to close, and the same can be said of AI art. Traditional artists can adapt and continue, even as AI opens a new artistic field that caters to a new audience. There will, however, still hopefully be a market for all of these different forms of art. Perhaps what Kamara Presumic said is true. AI has brought us too much optimization at the expense of improvisation. Even as AI art expands over the creative landscape, Perhaps the value of human creator art will persist, in part because it is not optimized, not stuck in a production loop. There is something about the temporary or irreplaceable nature of original objects that brings them value. A face carved into a rock that cannot be moved, or an oil painting on canvas. These can never be replicated perfectly in the way that digital forms of art are easily accessible. AI art may be aesthetically pleasing, and we may assign meaning to it as we do to traditional art pieces, or while AI art can be produced in much less time than traditional art pieces. And while all of this is true, while in a way AI may optimize creativity, there is still value in the human thought process and experimentation associated with a human created piece. And so I encourage you to explore the latest tools in our creative arsenals, but even as you do so, don't lose sight of the value of human creation. Thank you.
Okay, go back one side. When you hear the word or term artificial intelligence, what ideas or words come to mind? Would it be robotics, automation, evolution, computer science, or even ChatGBT? Ever since 1950, when the founding father of AI, Adam Turing, first branched this concept internationally, AI since then has evolved immensely by changing the way we live and use AI in our everyday lives. Technology back then was extremely limited, as the inventions back then weren't really that prevalent or normalized. But in our society today, AI has become more normalized and pre prevalent in our society. According to the Handbook of Artificial Intelligence, it states that AI is the part of computer science concerned with designing intelligent computer systems, that is, systems that exhibit characteristics we associate with intelligence and human behavior, which are understanding language, learning, reasoning, and solving problems. AI indeed offers a ton of innovation. We have seen that across many years, but over due to its efficiency and intelligence, but over time, this will only raise more concerns due to its uncertain potential, which could be possibly misused or abused in many ways possible. Now, I'd like you to, to imagine a story of me or a situation. Imagine a world where Machines, programmed by AI, are able to freely make their own decisions as well as have free will, similar to how us humans are living this world right now. What happens if suddenly, over time, these machines become so sophisticated and advanced that they go against all of our ide ideology or our beliefs? Due to this, they'll be able to outsmart and be superior against us humans in every single way possible. For example, physically, with their superiority in undergoing tasks for long periods of time without any fatigue. Mentally, with their superior processing speed and intelligence, they're able to get to results faster, more accurately, and quicker. And finally, mentally, where they're able to possibly emulate human traits and manipulate us. Just like in the Terminator movie that was released in 1984, the main character, Skynet, was tasked or controlled to go back in time to kill Sarah. But when, once he became self-aware about the situation and what was happening with humanity, he eventually saw humanity as an enemy. Even though this may feel unlikely in the near future, if we're not observant, if we're not observant, meaning that if we're too not cautious enough or too reliant on AI, this will lead to some dire consequences that could affect society and the world. This will lead to a few problems with AI. In AI, it has provided a ton of benefits, where businesses or even people would tend to get their hands on it so that it could further growth and help society even more. Due to this, businesses would tend to devote the majority of their resources towards AI. Even though this may seem good at first, it comes with a few cons. The first con would be that by devoting too much of your resources towards AI, this would cause too much energy consumption. And by leading with energy consumption, it would lead to the amount of information stored in AI, since AI is only able to be functional with information. The second con would be climate change, where with the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted, emitted, which was almost around a year ago, 626,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. Scientists as well, for the longest of time, are still unable to grasp the, hoof, the full picture of AI. This is due to how that over time, AI has been able to keep up with humanity, where it's able to accomplish more advanced tasks. And due to the task being more advanced, it shows that how that the, the systems in the AI will start to get more complex, meaning it will be harder for us or scientists to keep up with the understanding. Even though AI is able to understand, I mean, identify a certain concept, it may not to be, may, they may not be able to understand the certain concept or context behind it. An example of this would be in Tesla. Tesla introduced a feature called the autopilot feature, where when you decide to get in the car and drive away by pushing the button or pushing the autopilot feature, it makes sure that the AI inside the car takes over and makes all the decisions for, for you. 
do this, they'll be able to identify cars, pedestrians, stop signs, or even traffic lights. This arises the question, how are they able to know that you're not supposed to run over a red light? How are they able to know that when you see a pedestrian, you should stop instead of running over it? A, statistic, a stat came up that over 400 crashes of vehicles with partially automated driver assistance, assist systems, including 273 involving Teslas, according to stats released by US safety regulators. Due to this, AI isn't necessarily perfect, even though it provides a ton of benefits. Another example would be, let's say that you're in a robotics class. And in this robotics class, you're tasked to, with an AI to program a robot to get from point A to point B. The first group decides to use the traditional step-by-step -step process. And from what you can see here, it decides to build a robot, getting it from point A to point B by walking. In the second group, it decides not to use the traditional step-by-step -step process, and instead, it tells AI the goal, just the goal, which is to get from point A to point B. And by doing that, the AI builds a robot so tall in height that without doing anything, it just falls from point A to point B. Even though this may be ac accomplished the task, there's many meanings behind it. And due to this, this will show some biases, even though there's sometimes there could not be one correct answer. There is also a lot of competition in AI. This is due to how that, despite it being so successful, they will care more about the result instead of the way they get it. Another example would be, let's say you have a math test. And in this math test, you are said that you have to show your work from what you can see in this picture. Instead of showing your work, you just write down the answer. When the teacher tries to grade it, how will they know, how, how will they know that you got to the answer? There have been many possibilities. For example, you could cheat it, you could use the internet, you could use a calculator if it's not a calculator-friendly question, and et cetera. AI will do what we ask it to do, but not in the way we actually want. And due to this, this will lead to a few risks and concerns. The first risk and concern would be the black box dilemma. The black box dilemma is when the internal systems have difficulty in deciphering the reasoning behind the system's predictions and decisions. This is due to how that over time, from what I said earlier, AI will start to get more complex and keep up with humanity's needs and expectations. And due to this, this will make it more complex, leading to more parameters be being built in, in the algorithms. Due to this, this will cause AI to be more versatile, meaning they'll be able to adapt with harder tasks. They're also unable to see decisions. We are also unable to see decisions with no explainability. Due to this, it will be incomprehensive and possibly biased, which we are, which could, which will be, we're not sure of. They may also get to the end result, but since that, but many of us will start instead implement it because of how that the system is most of the time always right. So this lack of transparency in the decision making can erode trust. So what does it really take to trust AI? Or why should we trust something if we don't really know the meaning? So an example or story that happened about three years ago was in a simulation. In the simulation, they told OpenAI, from what Joyce mentioned earlier, of how that they used a simulation of how there will be an AI and a dying patient, or the dying patient is not real. So what you can see here, it seems that the conversation is going well. But after this, after the conversation goes well, and when it goes downhill, the patient says that she can't take it anymore, and says that, ask the AI if it should kill itself. And the AI abruptly responds by saying, I agree, you should kill yourself. With this result, it is unfortunately an error, due to how AI is always supposed to help humanity and use it as a tool. But unfortunately, due to the black box dilemma, we're still unable to know why the AI made that error, even though we know what the error of the out outcome actually is. This will lead to another problem or risk or concern, which would be the security risks. Malicious users would tend to exploit the vulnerabilities of AI due to how successful it has been over time. Due to this, they can extract sensitive information or by hacking for their own personal gain. Due to this, they may even, the AI might also even have a motive where they could try and manipulate us in a way where we would think that this could be true, but in reality, it's not. So what does it really take to trust an AI? An example that happened over three, three years ago where the AI was tasked to enhance a pixel image. The majority of us in this room can identify this pixel image as Barack Obama. But when the AI was tasked to enhance the pixel image, 
it got this random white male. This, however, as we all know, is incorrect. Even though it looked real and had a high resolution and a good image, it unfortunately still had a bias of how that AI, despite it doing so many good deeds, still has an error. Another example that happened about over 10 years ago would be with Knight Capital. Knight Capital is, one of, is an American global financing service that is the one of the largest traders in US equity. A program or, or event was introduced to Knight Capital that caught their eye. And do this, in order to get involved with the event, they had to type in code in advance to get involved with it. When they typed in the code and when the event came, a glitch unfortunately happened with the AI, where they had to they ex unintentionally executed 4 million trades that were almost 154 stocks, which totaled over $400 million. Due to this, they lost the majority of the company's equity value, which led to the company being disbanded. This will lead to the next recent concern, which would be job displacement. According to Talent Corp, just over 70% of employment is at high risk of automation in the manufacturing sector, reflecting the continued potential to automate the routine tasks that characterize many manufacturing jobs. This is due to how tasks over time will start to get more complex due to how AI is able to adapt and also our knowledge also increases. Due to this, there will be a higher demand in occupation qualifications, for example, of how like before, you wouldn't really need a degree or a bachelor's to accomplish the task, but maybe now if you want to be a doctor, you have to get a PhD. Example of this could be with electricians. Back in the day where there were no electricians, you had to replace the lamp manually. And another example would be with the cotton gin. Back in the day where you wanted to take out seeds from the cotton, there wasn't really a machine for that, so the humans had to do it. But now, since the cotton gin exists, it's really easy for the machine to do that. So this asks us the question, what jobs will, AI, will humans have since AI might not take over their jobs? Since there's no humans left to work, this can show the how that AI will have total control in the workforce. And by having total control in the workforce, this will show that AI will dominate the world, essentially. An example that happened over a year ago, where they experimented in Decatur, where a rum company in Poland, where they experimented Mika, the name of the, the AI, to be the CEO of the company. Even though this may look absurd, the responsibilities of the AI are still not that essential. For example, the responsibilities include finding artists to design the wine bottles or the rum bottles, as well as they are also unable to fire employees due to how it's still in the experimental testing. Even though this may be going well, this still may have a bias and also this could possibly start a trend with other, other companies. So how should we build our trust towards AI? I have three ways on how that we can build our trust. The first one being transparency. For what I said earlier on the black box dilemma, the internal systems make it extremely hard for us to understand, which could cause unpredictability, which could lead to us lowering our guard in a way. Do this to build trust. I propose that governments, in a way, should develop explainable models where, for example, they'll be able to be more accessible and understood in a, to a wider audience. For example, like pictures or graphs or even, even models. The second point would be awareness. We should implement adaptive learning. This is due to how that we'll be able to understand the certain patterns in AI, as well as the con how they're able to get the consistent base of knowledge. The lot should also implement, uh, wait, never mind, sorry. The lot should implement an educational program where in this educational program, we should discuss the various boundaries and concerns towards AI. And due to this, they could be also help to reduce the panic people have towards AI and also to grow co confident in our abilities with AI. The final point would be accountability. Since AI, from what I said earlier, is unpredictable, anything could happen. So we should pr I propose that we have a kill switch. In this kill switch, it could be as a, a, a way of how that, if some reason AI goes against our ideologies in, in a way, for example, like what I said in the beginning of the speech with AI suddenly changing how they act, this could help reduce the panic as well as the chance of AI destroying the world. Also, we should also learn from our past mistakes. Why should we build an AI where 
if one mistake can destroy the whole world despite it doing all the good deeds that affect society in such a beneficial way. And so what is the next step? In this next step, I was working on the project for the past few weeks. And this project it involved a survey where I got responses from various ages and perspectives in the lot. I asked them four ambiguous questions, which you can see on the screen. These are the questions I asked a few people. Due to this, the responses I got, I discussed them in a podcast where in this podcast, I discussed the various perspectives people have towards AI as with two of the most experienced people I know in the tech department, which are Mr. Roberts and Mr. Hartley. The result of this podcast lasted really well, where the podcast lasted around 30 minutes, and we were able to discuss these four questions and also to expand my knowledge on AI, as well as why people have these different perspectives, as well as some real, real examples, which I have used today in this presentation. The goal of this presentation, this, this, this project, was to confute the common misconceptions people have towards AI, and as well to help expand the different perspectives people have for AI, as well as to reduce the amount of panic we have. My hope is how that we are able to spread awareness that AI isn't necessarily perfect, despite its effectiveness towards society, and how we shouldn't devote everything towards AI. And if you'd like to know more about the podcast, I have Mr. Hartley and Mr. Roberts. Here is the QR code. And there's also a table where the QR code, if you want to scan freely. So in conclusion, AI has undeniably changed the way we function in the world today. We have see the, easily seen that ever since 1950. Did you ever imagine that back then we'll be using iPads, phones, or even computers in our everyday lives? Of course not. AI has affected so many sectors that has spread it so efficiently and effectively where it's basically used in our everyday lives and is really essential to us. Despite the numerous benefits AI offers to society, it's essential to recognize the potential concerns and consequences that come with AI. Thank you. Can I ask a personal question? How old are you? As those numbers flash across your mind, examine your response. Some of you may feel confident, secure in your age. Some of you may feel ashamed. And some of you may have forgotten how old you are. But most of you are probably thinking, how dare she question my age? How dare she ask how old I am? It is as if our level of oldness is placed on a moral scale, and your number, your age, determines if you will be accepted or rejected. It is taboo to discuss aging and age. We moralize age, elevating youth and shrinking from all that is deemed old. In Western culture, a culture obsessed with novelty and consumerism and afraid of being seen as old, we elevate anti-aging narratives. For example, as Martha B. Holstein states, quote, women often separate themselves from those negative descriptions of aging by asserting, I don't feel old, or I'm young at heart, or I'm 80 years young, or other assertions that elevate youth as a measure of all that is good and desirable. If our number begins to show in the way we move, or in our wrinkles, or in the way we appear, we are bombarded with reminders to hide this, to keep up the appearance that we are still young. And this narrative is not only deceptive, but dangerous. It can create distance between those who can maintain a youthful appearance and who are of a younger age, and those who cannot. It alienates those in our society who are deemed old. You might be wondering why I, a 17-year-old, would be interested in this topic. But from a young age, I have always loved listening to the stories and tales of people older than me, whether they be strangers or friends. Gray hair, white hair drew me. Once, when I was running down a street in my grandmother's neighborhood in the United States, I saw an elderly woman with a walking stick, and she was standing on her driveway. I smiled, waved, and walked away. But on an impulse, I returned the next day and dropped a note on her front desk, front porch. Long story short, she invited me to visit, and I learned a new perspective by listening to her tell stories 
of her childhood, her upbringing, and her love for teddy bears. While I only met her once, there was something about her that transcended her external appearance of age. There was a gentleness, a richness. But when I look around at Western media and the way we discuss age, I see a lack of value for the perspective of older people. I see a repulsion to aging and a disconnect between the young and the old. As I researched this and began to reflect on my topic, I noticed that anti-aging narratives may have an influence on this. Anti-aging narratives apply a moral code to aging and alienate those who in our society appear aged. While my paper focused on its effect on the elderly, those generally considered 60 and older, I find that this is re relevant to people of all ages because of how pervasive and prevalent anti-aging advertisements are. We feel the need to hide our age due to the elevation of youthfulness in our society. If you look around at our media, at our advertising, at the way we discuss age, and at the models and the age demographic of our jobs, you will notice that we glorify youth. We praise those who look young and act young. And this even underlies our beauty standards. Kathleen Slevin writes that, quote, the media convey that to be young and beautiful is to possess the most desirable form of cultural capital. As a result, women feel the need and pressure to maintain a, an appearance of youth. By extension, aging is portrayed as a crisis. As Carol Haber writes, with the emergence of the anti-aging industry in the 1990s, age, old age is painted as a fiend to be fought, not as, quote, a time for celebration and contemplation. As we are faced with these advertisements and media that condemn aging, we seek to hide the creases through skin products. We seek to remain young and dress in the latest fashions, to remain modern. We seek to hide that we are, the fact that we are on the path to old age. Yet by concealing and refraining from discussing the effects of aging, we stigmatize a normal process. Further, as Michelle Meager discusses, Marketing attempts to solve the cultural in invisibility of older people fail as the models in these advertisements reflect the, quote, energy of youth in bodies that only incidentally bear the markers of age. In other words, older models act young. As Stephen Katz says, they bridge the, they continue from middle age to old age without showing the physical difficulties of aging. Thus, we consumers have to conflict between the ideal representations of age in media and the changes happening in our own bodies. Further, anti-aging health prescriptions often elevate physical activity as a counter to aging. Yet, as Amelia DeFalco notes, these recommendations often overlook and often target those with health without health issues or disabilities and with the finances to partake in exercise. As a result, they overlook those from poorer health and economic backgrounds. At heart, the anti-aging narrative applies a moral code to aging and alienates those who do not fulfill its standards. As Tony Calasanti writes, the anti-ageist belief, quote, that people have control over their bodies and their health through such means as diet or exercise regimens, by being active or by consuming appropriate lifestyles, results in people who appear unhealthy being judged as deserving their suffering because they are to blame for not having altered their lifestyles to maintain health. This can take away, this idea can take away our empathy or interest in people who do not externally show the standards of successful aging. And aging individuals, as a result, may feel this cultural shame and blame themselves and consequently isolate themselves from social events because they have a fear of being judged. Yet, as Slevin writes about, this idea of control ultimately forces people to engage in, quote, a losing battle with the ravages of time as the work to conceal old age becomes more and more labor intensive. Consumers buy, but they buy into a delusion. This is part of the danger of the language of control. 
The anti-aging narrative continues this illusion of control and alienates those who are not aging successfully. Thus, we can give a lack of value given to those, we can give a lack of value to those of an older age. We can isolate and disconnect the young from the old. But this should not be the case. On the one hand, we need to recognize the physical difficulties and mental difficulties that anti-aging media hide. But on the other hand, we need to value what we can from growing older. Western culture needs a more balanced view of age, separated from the stigmas of anti-aging narratives. And this is what inspired my project. For my project, I created a booklet that addresses views of aging. I interviewed several Dalat staff from our community from different cultural contexts and generations, including baby boomers, millennials, and Gen X. These interviews were performed by email and in person. They are available in the back if you would like to take a look. I questioned them on how their view of age has changed over the years, how their cultural context affects their view of age, and how they value intergenerational relationships. While I entered with a desire to provoke reflection among the staff, I left personally transformed. I noted some interesting things during the interviews. During my interview with Mrs. Kearney, she had mentioned that just that morning, she had received an advertisement for hair dye on her social media feed, which really solidified for me how pervasive anti-aging media is. When I spoke to Mr. Derby, he mentioned how in the UK there's a lot of focus on external appearance in advertising, but I compared this with Mrs. Fahm, who mentioned that in New Zealand when she was growing up, she spent most of her time outdoors, and thus there was less of a focus on how you externally appeared. Nurse Nancy mentioned that in Canada, families live far apart from each other, and she encourages us to take care of the elderly, and I compared this with Mrs. Arul, who mentioned that in Indian culture, people continue to live with their families as they age and continue to gain respect. In the advice to the young section, many of the interviewees emphasize the importance of being present, being present at whatever age you are at. And I found this personally encouraging. On finishing the interviews, I left with a more nuanced and complex view of age. I did not fear aging. As I interacted with people of different generations than me, I grew in my compassion and learned a new and more wise perspective of the world. As Ms. Mavumba says, there's such wisdom in people, forget about age as people, and I feel like anybody can teach me something. I believe we're called to each other. Doesn't matter the age, but it matters the season. In other words, we can learn from one another, regardless of how old we are and how we appear. And this is part of the way you can reframe your view of aging. You can spend time with people older than you and younger than you. You can listen to their, their perspective and see their way of life. Joseph E. Davis and Paul Skirts write that spending time with older people prepares us for aging and reconciles us to the hardships and delights of late life. Second, as Holstein writes, we should honor not only the physical strengths an older person may possess, but also the intangible benefits of late life, such as, quote, delights, friendships, and self-acceptance. This shift of appreciation counters the anti-aging emphasis that our appearance and our level of activity is what determines if we are aging successfully. Second, on a third, on an individual level, you need to confront your capacity to age. Even if you are a teenager and the wrinkles have not yet set in, Davis and Skirts write that recognizing your bodily frailty and reliance on other people would lessen the, quote, fear that drives the young away from engaging with and making a place for the old. Further, confronting the realities of aging shows the young that the elderly, to quote Fritz Solange, are not they, but the future we. You need to question how anti-aging narratives in Western culture are shaping your value of older people. You need to examine why you feel the need to hide age. When you focus less on how you look as you age, you can engage in meaningful activities that transcend time, 
such as forming relationships, developing as a person, and being present in each moment. So let us ask and continue to ask the question, how old are you? But let us not stop there. Let us pierce beyond the surface level with more insightful questions, such as, what are your favorite songs? Who do you appreciate? And what brings you joy? Let us abandon our anti-aging veils and, and embrace the living human beings with wrinkling smiles and weakened joints in the window and in the mirror. Thank you. Good job. Oh, we should get bubble tea, right?